Barreling into the fiercest and most perilous of battles, the dogs of war have risked their lives and limbs for their fellow soldiers without a thought of hesitation. Loyal until their very death, these dogs have guarded, scouted, and encouraged men until all but their spirit was lost. It is these dogs' undying, everlasting spirit that has called forth men and rallied them in the bloodiest of battles. They made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our freedom, and in return, our four-legged veterans were denied their rights labeled as equipment and disposed of like trash. These dogs were our soldiers, and yet they are forgotten by many and remembered by few. These dogs were our heroes, our veterans. Dogs of war, the rights of our forgotten veterans. Since the dawn of warfare, when humans have traveled down the path to war, dogs have stood bravely beside us. Their obedience and loyalty is beyond doubt. Their devotion and bravery has led men to grasp victory from the hands of their enemies. Dogs were officially given responsibilities with the United States Armed Forces beginning with World War I when the British and the Belgians loaned their dogs to the American forces late in the war. These dogs were used to search the battlefield for the wounded and would also act as messengers. The spark of World War II ignited the U.S.'s military interest in war dogs, and in May of 1942, the U.S. Army received its first nine American-trained sentry dogs from an organization called Defense Incorporated. The company was interested in training dogs for the war effort, and by the end of World War II, the U.S. Army Canine Corps consisted of more than 10,000 dogs. Following the war, the Army supplied the Air Force with the canines until the Century Dog Training Branch of the Department of Security Police Training was established at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas in October of 1958. Seven years later, war erupted in Vietnam. More than 4,000 dogs were deployed and their presence in this war was imperative in combating the guerrilla tactics of the Viet Cong. In Vietnam, these dogs saved many lives during the course of their service, which involved guarding military facilities as sentries and patrols, as well as scouting to find explosives, underground tunnel complexes, and enemy weapon caches. From mid-1965 to the end of 1966, no Viet Cong soldier infiltrated a base guarded by sentry dogs. As the war neared its conclusion, the canine handlers asked for the right to take their dogs home with them, but the military claimed these dogs would be unhealthy and denied their requests. When the war in Vietnam ended, most of the dogs were euthanized or abandoned. Had these canines not earned the right to return to the U.S. for an opportunity to enter civilian life? As the war drew to a close, only 200 of the dogs were returned home. The rest were left as nothing but a surplus from the war. They were transferred to the South Vietnamese Army and were used as military working dogs. There were a number of them that were destroyed because we had a huge number of dogs over there. Military working dogs were classified as expendable equipment by the Department of Defense to alleviate the cost of bringing them home. Once they were classified as this, the dogs were not entitled to any transport back. The dogs that were allowed to come home could only spend the rest of their days as trainer dogs, but if they could not perform their duties, they would be euthanized. The Department of Defense also claimed that when a dog returns home, it is affected with health issues such as arthritis and post-traumatic stress disorder. Caring for them would be more costly than euthanizing them. Opponents of canine rights supported the use of these dogs when classified as equipment because it was cost-effective and thus would ignore the service and rights of these veterans. I've talked to several Vietnam handlers personally and some of their dogs were left behind because they were treated as equipment. Um, basically because the military and the Department of Defense are some cold-hearted people, they did, once they were described as equipment, the military treated them as equipment. And once that equipment is no longer needed, they dispose of it. Was it the military's responsibility to return home our heroes who risked their lives and showed bravery in the face of death to protect their fellow soldiers? These dogs were our soldiers, yet they were denied the rights they deserved as veterans, rewarded with nothing but a needle of euthanasia. Advocates for these canines have worked to ensure the development of military policies which reflect the responsibility to care for these dogs. These policies must recognize that while the military has a right to use these canines to protect our forces and carry out their duties, the right to use an animal for this benefit of humans must be balanced with the responsibility of caring for them. Canines who can no longer carry out their duties should be treated humanely and live out their lives with loving and caring families. Sarah had the opportunity for six months just to be a dog, to do whatever it was she wanted. She, didn't, she wasn't asked to go to work, she wasn't asked to do anything. She drank, she drank beer occasionally and she ate lots of steaks. Right now, we, it is totally different from the Vietnam era. Um, at, at this point, there's an adoption capability. If a dog is injured 
or it can no longer be utilized in the field, then the dog will be put up uh, for adoption. And the first rights are to the handler, who is currently handling the dog. If the dog isn't adopted locally, then it gets sent back here, and we have an adoption program worldwide where people call in. There's a waiting list that's about 18 months long. Eventually, the history of animal rights would be changed by one dog, Robbie. Robbie was an old silver muzzled Belgian Malinois who suffered from arthritis and elbow dysplasia. He was transported back to Lachlan Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, where he faced the evaluation to become a trainer dog. If he could not perform his duties, he would be euthanized according to the military policy at the time. Despite his handler's pleas to the military to allow him to adopt Robbie so that Robbie could at least enjoy the time he had left as a retired dog, his handler's request was denied. These higher-ups who had never worked with these dogs thought that the military working dogs were too highly trained to adjust to a mundane civilian life. This was not going to stop his handler. He wanted to see Robbie enjoy the time he had left and decided to tell the public about his issue. Animal rights history was going to change and it would start with Robbie. His call for canine rights resulted in thousands of outraged dog owners and veteran dog handlers taking responsibility into their own hands, creating petitions, sending emails, and making phone calls congressmen in the Department of Defense. They believed that these dogs had the right to enjoy the time they had left for serving and protecting our country. Representative Roscoe Bartlett took notice of their plight and drafted a bill that would form an adoption alternative to the military's harsh euthanasia policy. The bill, H.R. 5314, also called Robbie's Law, was sent to Congress, where it was approved without dissent. President Bill Clinton signed the bill on November 6, 2000. Dogs now had the right to come home with their handlers as veterans, but were still classified as equipment. Unfortunately for Robbie, the new law came too late to save him. On January 19, 2001, Robbie was euthanized, however, his legacy will live on. After Robbie's death, public awareness of the importance of the responsibilities these canines have in the military actions in Iraq and Afghanistan have brought about significant changes in military policy. After receiving numerous letters to improve the life of these dogs after their retirement, Representative Walter Jones and Senator Richard Blumenthal drafted a bill known as the K-9 Members of the Armed Forces Act, also known as the CMAFA, H.R. 4103 and Senate 2134. Within the act, they addressed the three tenets of military working dogs' rights, retirement and adoption, veterinary care, and recognition of service, as well as correctly reclassifying the dogs as K-9 members of the Armed Forces as opposed to equipment. When the CMAFA was introduced to Congress on February 27, 2012, it was not enacted. However, it would later become part of a larger bill. In January of 2013, President Obama signed the National Defense Authorization Act, H.R. 4310. The three tenets of military working dogs' rights from the CMAFA became part of the National Defense Authorization Act along with many other changes in military policy. This bill authorized military working dogs that are scheduled for retirement be transferred back to Lackland Air Force Base or any other canine training facilities. Before this law, adopters would pay thousands of dollars to return the dogs to the U.S. from their overseas assignments, hindering adoption of these dogs. In addition, a system would be formed to provide veterinary care for the dogs. Everything from the 2012 CMAFA was drafted into the new bill except for the reclassification of the dogs from being equipment to rightful canine members of the armed forces. I have a bunch of pets, as and everybody says, and you know, every time you leave a pet, you don't ever want to leave it. Does that make sense? So for me, I would say I would want them to be more than pieces of equipment. It's much different from an M16 that you take and put into a cabinet and lock away. As long as these animals remain classified as equipment, there remains a formidable chance that their treatment will not be worthy of those who have saved countless lives and assisted the military in achieving its objectives. Because of Robbie, dog owners, military veterans, and congressmen. The history of animal rights has been changed. Dogs are now allowed to come home to the United States and live peacefully in retirement as our veterans. Military working dogs are soldiers, heroes of war. Throughout history, they have fought bravely alongside us, and yet they were denied their rights as veterans. They deserve the rights that a person or society sees as moral. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that these military working dogs are guaranteed the same rights as all heroes? These dogs were and are our veterans. The few, the forgotten, the brave, our soldiers, dogs of war.